All right, so hello and welcome back. So yes, it has been a while. Uh, a lot of stuff happened and the microphone broke. So we have a new one. So you have to tell me how that audio sounds for the next, you know, four something videos. Otherwise, I found this uh, video a little while ago. While British, why, what British soldiers thought about American soldiers during World War II by Immersus Tech, okay? I'll leave the link uh, to the video in the description. We are breaking this up into two parts because I like to hear myself talk, and apparently so do you. So, without further ado, let's get into it. Many people have enjoyed watching and commenting on an earlier video from Immersus Tech called What German Soldiers Thought About Allied Soldiers World War II. Viewer Rob Roy Boaz requested a video about how British soldiers viewed American soldiers in World War II, so the credit for this idea goes to him. Thanks Rob Roy Boaz. By the way, Rob Roy is one of my favorite films of all time. So. What did British soldiers think about their American counterparts in World War II? There are many aspects to this, so we'll break the subject down into different areas. There were cultural differences between the two groups that could sometimes cause misunderstandings or friction. Keep in mind that it's impossible to know what all British soldiers thought about all the Americans fighting alongside them, but we can get a good idea of the general consensus. To get the most out of this subject, it would be best to watch the entire video. The combat in general's portion is near the end. United States troops mobilized and started arriving in the United Kingdom in 1942, safely running the gauntlet of the German U-boats, which seemed to operate with impunity in the Atlantic at that time. Even though the United States had only been in the war for a little over two months, the 34th Red Bull Infantry Division a federalized National Guard division, had already landed in Northern Ireland on January 26th. The vast majority of American soldiers had never been abroad, so this was a new experience for them and their host. The British population breathed a great sigh of relief when the United States entered the war. Even though the Soviet Union had been attacked a little over five months earlier, for the first time, British people could feel confident that they were no longer just fighting for their lives, but were now on the winning side. This great joy, however, was tempered by an irritation that the U.S. had waited so long to join, and had to be pushed into the war by the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and the German declaration of war on the United States. Many British soldiers felt they were on a moral high ground because they had been fighting Germany since September 1939. All the while, the United States had stood on the sidelines while France fell. Although, in the end, British soldiers generally developed a high regard for their American counterparts during World War II, there were some criticisms and complaints about certain aspects of American military culture and behaviors. Most British soldiers had never met an American soldier before 1942. They weren't sure exactly what they would be like. At that time, foreign travel for most ordinary people was impossible due to the expense, so the United States was a very exotic place in the British mind. Hollywood Western films were very popular in the UK, and they portrayed Americans as gangsters or rough and tumble cowboys, who would chase Indians or have a gunfight in the middle of the town. It didn't take British soldiers too long. Now, okay, so breaking this up a little bit. Those are American soldiers, by the way. Um, you, I can actually tell because of the bolt handle on the M1903 Springfield that they're holding. Um, yes, the U.S. basically wore the same helmet in the very beginning of the war. So as I said, the, the Red Bull Division went to Northern Ireland, right? Their National Guard unit, it means they don't have the most modern equipment, especially in 1942 because we're starting to gear up. So what they had is Brody, helmet, oh, Brody helmets, in our case, we modified them to be M1917 helmets. And yes, those were still used for a very long... Actually, they are pretty much used the entirety of World War II in the United States for basically coastal defense. I mean, it was a helmet. You don't need the most modern stuff if you're on coastal artillery battery, right? But uh, these units will get, in, get the M1 helmet later. But it's important to point out that uh, 
our uniforms might actually look very similar in 42 um, if they're wearing the M1917 helmet. So I just thought I would point that one out. ...long to form initial opinions about their newly arrived American allies. For one thing, many Americans like to brag a lot and show off, which was looked down upon in reserved British culture. They sometimes found American slang and accents difficult to understand. An American GI, which is what U.S. soldiers were called back then, standing for government issue, would saunter into a pub and throw his wad of money onto the table, which was also offensive to British soldiers for two reasons. Number one, they were envious that the Americans had bank rolls like that, and it was considered lowbrow to show off money in public. Other negative adjectives and phrases that British soldiers use for Americans. Unrefined, crass, loud, ill-prepared, brash, arrogant, lacking manners, obnoxious, poorly trained, poorly educated, poorly disciplined, overpaid, oversexed, overconfident, full of themselves, cocky, uncouth, sloppy, too informal, undisciplined, naive, barely housebroken. Okay, let me, let me go through some of uh, some of these uh, comments that the British have made, okay? So, just for some context here, the British have been fighting, you know, the Germans since 1939, September. Although their ground forces will really wouldn't see any action until basically 1940 with the fall of France, okay? Most of what happened in 1939 and then in the phony war a little bit um, was basically naval and air uh, for the British side and other actual ground troops. Now, talking about... Uh, Everything you see over there, um, this is not an un—I want to say unfair assessment. Okay, what you have to understand is that the American Army had basically had selective service introduced in 40, 41 to start getting men into the military. Okay, and that means that they're not volunteers, right? To grow the army, you have to conscript people. Not all of those people, you know, want to be there necessarily. Um, and they didn't have a choice. But after Pearl Harbor, again, there's a lot of volunteers. Now, the Americans have not actually been in a big war since 1917, okay? And yes, the upper staff, so the officers and generals, knew that this war had been going on for quite a while. Um, but again, American exceptionalism is uh, always pops up in every single war that we fight. And it was no different here. Again, we thought we would go over there and win. And uh, the British have been slugging it out for now the better part of almost three years, uh, losing a lot of men. And the Americans, again, they didn't have any of the combat experience or any of the realities of what was going to be happening. So in 42, I can see this being pretty accurate of the American soldier um, just because they don't have much combat experience. Now, again, in North Africa, that's going to change pretty significantly. But we'll leave it at that. Even with these negative views, British soldiers were extremely happy that the United States had to enter the war against the Axis powers. However, there were some good initial opinions. Some stated that U.S. soldiers were well-equipped, eager, enthusiastic, brave, generous, better late than never, hospitable, independent thinking, friendly. One Briton who worked with American troops and airmen during World War II, described them this way. They were So, going back just a second there. You know, you can see that there are some benefits here, right? Again, you're conscripted, or volunteered, uh, don't have much combat experience, if not at literally zero, and you were either in the Guard, or you were in the regular Army units um, in 42. Again, it depends if you volunteer or conscripted on that matter. And again, you basically are, uh, I don't want to get uh, YouTube censored, so we'll just say um, eager uh, to fight the Germans. So that's what we will say there. World War II. Describe them this way. They were a strange bunch. Good, brave, and eager to fight the Nazis. Many of them were brash, arrogant and thought the war was over when they arrived, like the news of their arrival in the UK would scare the bleep out of the Fritz. It didn't. Of course.
One of the first things that British soldiers noticed about their American counterparts was that they were well fed, although not all of them were as tall as they had imagined from the cowboy movies. American soldiers were not fat, but they were overall better nourished, more muscular, with more color to their cheeks and better teeth than their British peers. By the time the Americans began to arrive, the British had been in the fight against the Axis for almost a year and a half and had suffered reversals on almost every front while continuing to endure the shortages from a U-boat partial blockade. It seemed that there were shortages of everything, but American soldiers always seemed to have the food that British servicemen craved. A British airman was stationed in the West Country during the war, and Americans, also based there, invited him and some of his friends to their base for donuts. It was a luxury he never forgot, and he remembered the taste of those donuts for the rest of his life. So speaking on that part, okay. So yes, the British rationing system was basically implemented as soon as the war started because they're an island nation and they have to get everything shipped in. And the rationing didn't even stop until the after the war. Um, British still used conscription until the 50s um, just to police the empire. And they were still rationing, well, I think into the 50s of uh, goods for the British just because they didn't have a choice on because uh, the supply lines were cut and all of that other stuff and even after the war they didn't have the money to uh, open up everything now speaking to the americans of having basically all the logistics possible this is true this is what it makes the american army mostly different from the german army is basically what i would come up with you see the german army is very tactical and very operative in their battle strategy but they don't to me think strategically again this is during world war ii the strategically meh Logistics is for other people, not me as the general. Meanwhile, on the American camp, it's the complete opposite. It's like, no, everyone will do logistics because that's actually how we win wars, okay? Speaking on the dietary part of this, um, you have to really go back. Americans are ginormous compared to everyone, I'll say everyone in Asia, okay? We are stupidly tall and stupidly big compared to those people. Now, why is this? Well, very simply, without going into a massive essay on this, uh, rice versus wheat, that, okay, um, is one of the contributing factors why even Europeans are taller than most Asian people, okay? Well, I'm also Asian, so, you know, don't, eh, I'm 5'10", right? But that, and also the Americans have always had a very more nutritious diet, per se, and that started when the American Americas were being colonized. So in the 16, 1700s, for specifically from North America in this case, in the U.S., uh, they were usually two to four inches taller than their European counterparts, okay, just because of the variety in our diet that we actually got fed, okay? And then if you only extrapolate that to be like another 300 years later, you can see that it takes time for stuff to catch up, right? So that's generally why the Europeans were slightly less tall than us, um, especially back then, because just of the food. Um, and especially after World War One, because, you know, everything was devastated over there. So nutrition plays a part in that. That's what I was trying to get at. That's why the Americans are kind of seen as ginormous, or they thought they would be, right? And they still were technically somewhat bigger than uh, British people. But now the entire world is mostly Europe and, uh, the, and America are generally uh, the same height, roughly speaking, unless you go to the Netherlands, and then it's just crazy. He found his new American friends to be generous and hospitable. When you read what British soldiers wrote after the war, many of them stated that they were impressed by the lavish amount of gear that U.S. soldiers had and the quality of it. They were also envious because some of that military equipment was hard to come by. American tanks supplied to the British early on in the North African campaign weren't perfect, but they were mechanically reliable, whereas the British found that their own tanks broke down at a much higher rate in the desert. So, speaking on this, let's go to that. So, the Crusader tank. We all love Crusader tanks. They all look neat and are very fun and fast. The problem is, the cruisers, uh, Cruiser Tank series line, uh, the problem was they're terrible in reliability, and there's a lot of stuff you go into. The air filter was a very big problem in North Africa, and here's a fun fact. Um, it doesn't matter how good your tank is if you won't start. So, you could have the best tank, but if it can't get moving when you need it to, it's basically a sitting box of steel that can't do anything, right? So, when the American M3 Grant 
this tank right here, as you will see, um, or Lee, just not going to get into that one, um, showed up in Africa. The British were like, well, it works technically and it's reliable. It starts. Now, we don't like the fact that, you know, it has a double turret on there and machine guns out the wazoo, but, you know, it'll get the job done. So that's what they were given. And then later, the M4 Sherman will come and show up in North Africa. And yes, the Americans actually do send the Shermans first to the British in Africa, mostly because they were engaged in combat. And then we'll start giving it up to regular American units, okay? So technically, the British got it first. And they're like, wow, this is not a shit tank. Oh, my God. This kills everything that we need to kill. It's fast. And most importantly, it doesn't break down and it's reliable. So, yeah, the perfect tank in 1942, you know, pretty much all around. Uh, now, later, again, it will start getting outgunned in 43, 44, really. It's really 44 um, when we start running into problems because of people not wanting to accept the 76mm Sherman. And, and then even the 76mm Sherman will have problems in very specific cases in 44 and 45, but I'll leave that for later. British troops were also impressed by the American M1 rifle and the Sherman tank, which they later improved with a 17-pounder anti-tank gun as its main weapon, and called it the Firefly. Okay. I wouldn't say an improvement. We'll talk about the M1. Yes, British soldiers probably wanted the M1. Now, everyone's going to be like, oh my god, the Lee Enfield is so great, though. All right. If you watch for on weapons, or if you watch in range, you will understand that bolt-action rifle... This is not as superior to a semi-automatic rifle. This is why the Americans were the only army in World War II to fully field their combat troops. Okay, everyone on the front line had an M1. People in the back, yeah, that'll vary, right? But everyone that had needed an M1 had an M1 in the front lines, okay? In 40, late 42-ish and 43, past that, okay? And even the United States had production problems. But that rifle seriously gave an advantage to every American, mostly because if you ba 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 so if you miss your first shot, you miss, and then you shoot again, and you hit the target. Or if he's running, you miss, you miss, and then you hit. Okay, you can do that with a semi-automatic rifle. That's why you could, the M1 is still at least relevant today. Okay, a bolt action, if you shoot, and by the time you have to cock the handle, I have a bolt action somewhere here, but you cock it, or if you have to pull a straight pull rifle, you pull it back, okay, you slam it forward, you then have to reacquire it, and he's gone. So, yeah, the M1 uh, rifle is a very <laughs> good rifle for the fact that it was semi-automatic. And the British probably, more than likely, all wish they had those. Now, the Sherman Firefly being an improvement on the Sherman, yeah, I don't know about that one. Okay, technically, technically, it has a better gun. Now, that's this is like the technical engineer's perspective is, yes, it technically has bigger gun, therefore it works. And if you're like... That's not actually how it works, because if you go inside, you're like, oh my god, how do you even fit in this tank, right? The gunner has to sit like this, and then he has to aim his periscope, which is, like, on the floor, so he's got to be, like, and to aim the gun, right? And then you have to put this big round in the Sherman, and then slam it into the gun. Now, this Firefly was the M4s, M4 and uh, Shermans, okay, M4 and M4A1s. These Shermans had a small turret. The U.S. Army tried to put a 76 millimeter gun, okay, 76 millimeter gun into that turret um, because they always wanted the bigger gun, right? The U.S. armor, basically army, uh, armored section founders like, hey, yes, this technically fits in the turret, but its ergonomics are terrible, okay? That's what they thought about the 76 millimeter gun. Then they got a bigger turret. They put the 76 in and everyone was happy in 43, 44, okay? Really, it was 44 when those started actually being produced. Um, but designed in 43. Anyway, so they're like, okay, well, there it goes. The 76 now works in 44. This is not a expanded turret. This is a smaller turret. So you can imagine the Americans' horror and shock if they actually tried to get into that turret and be like, well, we couldn't fit a 76 in here, and now you want to put a damn 90 millimeter? Well, 17 pounder. Let's just go, you know, bigger than 76. They're like, huh. Yeah, it was a terrible shock. Anyway, that's all to say that, yes, technically bigger gun, Lower ammo capacity and your multi shots, the the ability to shoot rapidly over this gun, no. But 
it was around, and it could technically kill the German armor that was in the Normandy hedgerows, and the Americans didn't have the 76mm Shermans there. So this is the only thing that could actually kill anything that was a tiger or a panther. Another criticism was that the American soldiers could be too wasteful and undisciplined with their resources. British soldiers, who were used to living with strict rationing and shortages, sometimes found it difficult to understand the American practice of throwing away food and other supplies that they didn't immediately need. One British sailor on a Royal Navy cruiser in the Pacific realized that, although they ate well, it was nothing compared to what U.S. sailors got. He saw that American sailors had air conditioning, steak, and ice cream. Now, it's not like these American sailors had ice cream and steak all the time, okay? Yeah, I'll give you an important antidote here, antidote here, okay? The carriers had an ice, ice cream machine, okay, and they had some ice cream sometimes, not all the time. Um, so a destroyer, this is a funny anecdote, a destroyer, so let's just say the aircraft uh, of the aircraft carrier got shot down. The destroyer went out for a search and rescue mission. They found them um, and then brought them aboard. So then they went to the carrier to go, you know, transfer him back to the carrier. And the uh, uh, on their way, they signal with their little searchlight. They're like, hey, we have a pilot. How much ice cream do you want to trade for him? So that was their way of being like, hey, please give us some ice cream. We're on a destroyer. <laughs> we don't have any. But yeah, there you go. North Africa, after realizing that they could work together for their mutual benefit, a British air squadron and a U.S. air squadron decided to barter. The Brits had scotch, and the U.S. had flying gear. They would haul scotch to the U.S. base and load up with flight jackets to go back. British soldiers loved American equipment. A Royal Artillery officer, who was later transferred to Signals, told a story about being re-equipped in North Africa. He said that American equipment was excellent compared to what the British had, and they loved getting it. U.S. equipment always came with spare parts. The Jeep they received came packed full of items, including a full tool kit, spare tires, spare oil, and air filters. The Dodge truck they received in Italy even had a heater. British soldiers were more used to a make-do-and-mend attitude and became skilled at improvising with less than adequate equipment. However, when they did get the good American stuff, they treasured it. And that's really not surprising, okay? Even today, most people are like, wow, American Army, you can literally just, you know, pump out money and have supplies and equipment everywhere, right? Now, this is an interesting photo, okay? So, I think I can point it out. Over here, uh, down here, right here, this is a cruiser tank. This is what was replaced by the M3 Grant slash Lee slash whatever you want to call it if it's American or British, okay? Then, this was replaced by the M4 Sherman over here. And these are all still being operated at the same time in North Africa. Yeah, because equipment never goes to waste. Especially for the British, as we were finding out here. Some British soldiers even kept the Jeep's toolkit for many decades after the war was over and passed them on to their relatives as an inheritance. American blankets were worth their weight in gold in Allied-occupied Italy, where they could be traded for huge quantities of wine from the natives. One British soldier fondly remembered an amazing drunken weekend in recently liberated Rome that he and his pal experienced, which they funded by trading just one U.S. blanket. British troops were also jealous of U.S. uniforms. British battle dress was virtually impossible to wash properly without it shrinking. It took ages to dry out when wet and looked old-fashioned, while the American uniform looked stylish and could be cleaned far more easily. Okay, I'll get to this point, all right. Now, yes, the British had their pattern 36, I believe, battle dress uniform, which is what they have on the right side there, okay? It had a little leg pocket, and then it had uh, some other stuff, and it had jack nail boots or ammunition boots, okay? Now, this uniform specifically was developed for mechanized warfare, um, specifically because it was meant to replace the World War I uniform. There are some actual interwar photos and even some early 39 and 40 photos where you see some British troops with the early uh, World War I uniform still on. 
and you can see that they have an overcoat and they have their um the easy way to tell is that this jacket here if you look back in 1939 photos and even before then uh, just right before the war you'll see, see some british soldiers wearing uh war one gear and the easy way to tell is this tunic doesn't cut off its ammunition belt it actually extends all the way down to their lower leg okay uh basically their top of their thighs there we go it will extend down there and there'll be a pocket there, okay? That's how you can tell if it's a World War One uniform. This is the World War II uniform. They shorten the jacket, then they bring the pant to the natural waistline. And the reason they did this is there's less stuff that's going to snag if you have to jump in and out of a Bren carrier, okay? This was the thinking in 1939, 1940, and even before then because that's why they built the uniform in, I think, 36, something like that, um, when they did the mechanization trials and all that stuff after World War One, right? Now... Yes, the uniform is starting to get old, especially by the later half of the war, okay? Now, here's a problem. That uniform right there. This one, not a lot of people actually in the U.S. like this uniform, okay? Um, it had problems, especially with these uh, gaiters they had, okay? Now, it was also being replaced slowly because, again, not everyone liked it. Um, by the M1943 uniforms, and you can tell those uniforms. Um, I'll see if I can put up a, uh, a photo majigger thing up here. Um, but the reason they liked the M43 uniforms a lot better was because it was more comfortable, okay? It had better boots. Uh, they're easier than the gaiters were. It blended in more. It was green overall. It was, you know, basically probably one of the best uniforms to actually have um, in 44, late 45. Again, this doesn't go away the entire war, okay? It starts slowly being replaced by the M1943 uniform uh, around late 44. This is way after D-Day. Uh, or after D-Day, they start getting the 43 uniforms into the supply line, okay? I would say that the 43 uniform is better than the British one. Now, I don't know about the M42 uniform. Uh, that's debatable. While the American uniform looks stylish and could be cleaned far more easily, In 1942, a British infantry private earned two and a half shillings a day. An equivalent U.S. serviceman earned $50 a month, which worked out to be about three times the amount the British soldier earned. After the passage of the United States Pay Readjustment Act of June 1942, the lowest American servicemen earned roughly more than 80% of all skilled civilian workers in the United States. Servicemen had tax advantages and were given everything they needed, including food, soap, clothing, and so forth. However, British soldiers had to purchase some of the necessities out of their own meager pay. Most couldn't even afford to buy enough postage stamps, cleaning material, and toothpaste. The British private often found himself in a humiliating position when he met American soldiers in a pub. He could buy one beer but he didn't have enough money to buy any more rounds of drinks. Even some locals and allied soldiers like the Americans would offer to buy more drinks for him, but he would be embarrassed at his imposition and many times decline. In order to avoid this potential embarrassment, an enlisted British soldier would sometimes avoid bars that had other allied soldiers in it if he could. Americans could go to cinemas which they called movies, whenever they wanted, but the average British soldier couldn't afford it. This became such a serious issue that it was brought to Prime Minister Winston Churchill's attention. Okay, so, just a fact, yes, the Americans got paid substantially a lot more, probably than better pay than pretty much every other soldier that fought during World War II. I'm pretty much going to stand by that. Um, now, this is actually kind of reversed in modern day. We're talking like 2023 20, standards here, okay? A U.S. Army private gets like twenty three, twenty six thousand dollars a year, right? And if you go to actual European armies, British Army, Belgian, Netherlands, the regular privates over there get paid substantially more in euros than the USD, okay? Um, so that's just because, again, they have a smaller army, that's more professional, professional small army, and they can afford to pay the. Um, uh, the price of having, you know, people stay in longer versus the Americans need more manpower. It's just quite simply that if you're a European nation with a small army, you don't need that many men. You can pay them substantially more than if you're the U.S. Army that needs 
today to the, to this day still needs a lot of able-bodied people. Um, so there's that. This is a very little known fact, but the first American victory in World War II was won in the United Kingdom. Swaggering, brash, money-laden GIs won over some of the fair, lovelorn British maidens' hearts. With a certain amount of British soldiers all fighting overseas, there was a wee lack of eligible men of marriageable age for the British women available. To British girls brought up on the cinema, who copied the dress, hairstyles, and manners of Hollywood stars, the sudden influx of Americans, speaking like the actors in films, who actually lived in the magic country and who had plenty of money, at once went to the girls' heads. The American attitude towards women, their proneness to spoil a girl, to build up, exaggerate, talk big, and to act with generosity and flamboyance, helped to make them the most attractive boyfriends. In addition, they picked up girls easily, and even a comparatively plain and unattractive girl stood a chance. Like the song says, girls just want to have fun. Well, it's easier to have fun with your honey if you have money. The scent of money can act as an aphrodisiac to some. Many American troops like British and Irish women in general more than American women, according to different sources. Furthermore, they also had access to supplies such as chocolate and silk stockings from the PX store. The level of popularity of GIs became more apparent by the number of GI babies that started to appear. During the war, having a child out of wedlock was considered to be a source of great shame. These children were often handed over for adoption, or families would cover up their origins. One American soldier from the small town of Millsboro, Pennsylvania, John Husack, wrote this to his friend back home. Boy, Alden, as long as there is an England, I won't have to worry about being a bachelor. Later in the letter, he said that the air raid shelters sure come in handy when you're courting a girl. Toward the end of the letter, he suspected that it might not be his personal charms that kept the ladies attentive, but the chewing gum and candy that he had been given them. By 1947, 60,000 British and 1,800 Irish women had married American servicemen and immigrated to the United States. There were so many British war brides in New York City that they formed friendship clubs to support each other. That's actually a really substantial amount of um, people when you think about it. It's like 60,000 British, 18,000 Irish, what, 78,000 people, women, right? Bring over from uh, the United Kingdom and then Ireland. Um, it's actually a substantial amount, especially back then because the populations were a lot smaller. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty significant. And, yes, GI babies pop up wherever the U.S. goes. So there you go. All right. So we're going to end it there. Uh, come back for part two. It should be up tomorrow, and we shall continue this series. Part two will be up there. Otherwise, thank you for watching. Uh, you can go to my Patreon to support me. Otherwise, see people tomorrow.